an important point to start with is um, the notion of qualia, which philosophers have given us, and David Chalmers in, in particular has talked about the hard problem. Now, you know, David is a philosopher. Uh, the hard problem for him is a hard problem because he's a dualist and a panpsychist. He's not a physicalist. He doesn't believe that consciousness is a feature of the brain. It's, it's something else. So he says, yeah, the brain does all that easy stuff, but consciousness is this otherworldly kind of thing. Um, I'm not using the words he would use probably, but I think you get the point that I'm making. The problem is that he encouraged, I don't know if he encouraged, but somehow the qualia thing and the, the heart problem has been adopted by neuroscientists as if, you know, okay, we have to solve the heart problem. But the heart problem was created in a way that it can never be solved. It's not physical. If it's not physical, you can't study it scientifically, right? So <laughs> I think it's it's just a you know it's the wrong it's the wrong uh, it's a dead end. It's the wrong approach. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number one hundred and seventy-two. Also here with pins the podcast and a new T-shirt that reads Geesling. I'm not going to explain it. It's for, for those of you in the know. I think it'll be called the OG Geesling T. And there's also an OG Geesling sweater. It's also out there. Anyway, so as I mentioned, this episode is with Joseph Ledeau, who is, and get ready for a very impressive list of titles. He's Henry and Lucy Moses professor of science. He is university professor. He's professor of neuroscience. He is professor of psychiatry, and he is professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at New York University, where he works in neuroscience and related areas. So Joseph also has a, a very expansive career and list of publications behind him and probably ahead of him too. But one major focus of his research has been emotions like fear and anxiety in humans and other animals. And quite fittingly, he is also the, the front man of the amygdaloids, which is a band and we, we talk briefly about it. But more topical is actually the the amygdaloids, especially as a band name, is, is quite topical. But more topical is Joseph's recent book, The Four Realms of Existence, A New Theory of Being Human, which came out earlier this year. And it breaks down what it is to be human into four components, biological, neural, cognitive, and conscious, though, of course, all of these things are biological for humans. But in in this episode, we talk about these four realms and we get into some big questions about them, like the nature of biological life, how nervous systems evolved, and the relationship between consciousness and cognition. Reviews, likes, comments, all these things are really, really helpful, and I'm needing them. Uh, at the moment. I wasn't going to mention this, but uh, on the spur of the moment, I will. I am going down to two episodes for a little while just because I I have to pay somebody to do the editing and the thumbnails, and I am losing money on the show. So I uh, can't afford to keep doing as many episodes as I have been doing. But the the likes, the follows, those sorts of things help a lot. And now, uh, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Joseph. I saw that you, you've written on psychoanalysis, and I actually, I couldn't get a copy of this, but I think I saw a book that you contributed to called rock music and psychoanalysis uh, but i i have this yeah i have i have the sense that the majority of psychologists and neuroscientists working today especially those that i've talked to are not really 
fans of Freud or psychoanalysis. So before we got to the meat of what I want to talk about today, I just wanted to know what it is about psychoanalytic theory or Freud's work that's meaningful for you. Oh, I'm, I don't, I don't really write about psychoanalysis. I mean, I've, I've commented on it from time to time. Um, but I, I, I guess the, let me put it into a perspective. Um, so in the mid 20th century, basically, you know, behaviorism was the dominant force within academic psychology. But in psychiatry, Freud was like more of a, a powerhouse, right? And um, th there was a, you know, with the, the rise of cognitive science uh, and the demise of behaviorism a bit, there was a real serious effort to try to make everything very um, quantitative and to develop metrics for everything. Uh, so psychiatry, in order to put Freud in the back room, back uh, the rearview mirror, um, basically shut down everything that was that Freud was talking about, including the fact that mental states are mental states. Um, and so the effort became one of focusing on behavior as the main readout of mental health, um, rather than what people said or how they how they were feeling. Now, people go to therapists typically because they feel bad and want to feel better. Um, but in in the new psychiatry, the biological psychiatry and the rise of pharmaceuticals, the effort was about developing things through, for example, animal research, which I've done a lot of, a lot of animal research, um, where if you made a rat freeze less or avoid less, it was assumed the reason that the rat froze or avoided less was because they were less fearful or anxious in that situation. Therefore, if you give a drug that makes the rat less fearful or anxious, supposedly less fearful or anxious, to a person, then they should feel better. But, you know, the, the medications are not really a panacea. Um, what do they do? Well, let's say you have a person with social anxiety. What the medications can help do is uh, make it a little easier to go to the party by inhibiting uh, avoidance behavior and by uh, uh, reducing uh, hyperarousal and so forth. So the medications in that sense are kind of doing what they were designed to do in the animal studies, but not what they were intended to do in the animal studies, which is to make people feel less fearful or anxious. So a person with social anxiety is going to go to the party and still going to feel anxious. But if they've kind of calmed down the, uh, uh, the behavioral and physiological responses, then they're a little less, um, you know, they can be a little more comfortable and use the medication as a way to uh, kind of deal with some symptoms and then maybe take some forays into social interactions and so forth without feeling all jittery and, and tense and so forth. So, I, you know, I, my position is that fear and anxiety are mental states. Uh, they're not behavioral responses that if we uh, we have to change behavior and physiology, but you need to leave room then to also be able to have the patient uh, then interact with the therapist and talk about it. Now, the, my point is that, you know, first you have to tame the amygdala. So, you know, drugs may be helped there or maybe uh, CBT and so forth, where the amygdala is not driving you to do things. Um, this is all metaphorical. I'm not going to be too, you know, uh, uh, localizations about all this. But we'll use the, the amygdala as a metaphor for behavioral and physiological response control. So if you have a, a medication or a, a therapeutic approach that can do that, like tame, turn down the volume on those things, then um, you can go to step two, which is to tame the hippocampus. In other words, to um, help the person kind of revise uh, their what their memories are and what how they think about themselves. A lot of episodic memory changes change the way you think about yourself. And then once you've done that, then you're ready to use or tame the prefrontal cortex, basically, where you can now engage in talk therapy uh, 
without being so burdened with all of those other things. So that, I mean, that's kind of my perspective on that. It's not that I love Freud. It's just that Freud, uh, you know, at least had the understanding that anxiety was a mental disorder. Um, and if you look at the NIMH RDoC, which is supposed to be a way of uh, categorizing symptoms uh, independent of diagnoses, in other words, people uh, with depression, anxiety, autism, all feel, uh, let's say, depression, uh, with the pr diagnosed as having depression, anxiety, or autism, all have uh, feel threatened in some way at times. Um, so threat is one of those kinds of categories of things that cuts across category across diagnostic categories. So there were lots of, of um, uh, you know symptom categories that that are on one axis and other things on the other axis in the the R dot. Um, and you know there's one little thing called verbal report, and that's supposed to uh, reflect subjective experience, but it's totally marginalized. It has no real role. The subjective experience is, has no real role in this RDoc thing, or in psychiatry in general. Uh, it's the medical model where, you know, you, you can't trust what the patient says, um, because they may have a, a pain here, but it might be due, for something, due to something in the neck over here or something, you know. So um, I, I think we need to really just get the mental back into mental disorders. You know, otherwise, people are going to continue to suffer. And I've written papers on that. So I'm not, I'm not a Freudian. I, I, maybe I've been in a couple of uh, articles or maybe magazines that might have something to do with psychoanalysis. I've done, I wrote something about Eric Kandel for some psychoanalytic magazine and other things like that. But I'm definitely not a, a big fan of psychoanalysis. I'm not a, totally opposed to it because I think it's probably useful too. Um, once you've tamed the other uh, components. Now, you brought up the psychoanalysis and music um, book that I was in. Um, and that, again, that was more about my music. I guess my work was part of why I was there. But the guy was trying to find musicians who had some relationship to uh, therapy. Hmm, got it. Well, I'll, I'll just uh, start at the beginning with some some random thoughts. And you mentioned the shift from away from behaviorism to maybe the the scientific study of cognition, and you write about it at length in, in the four realms of existence, which is what I'd like to get to eventually. So maybe we'll talk more about that then. And I did I didn't mean to put you on on the spot about psychoanalysis, but because I know it's a charged topic, I'd just seen that you'd written about it. And to be clear, though, uh, right? But I I'm wanted to and I wanted I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about the, um, uh, you know, the, the mental and mental disorders anyway. So we got that out of the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm, I'm a fan and I, and I think it is very interesting. But just to clarify for me what your general position is, it's that treating mental disorders uh, requires thinking of them as mental states. So beyond the pharmaceutical model that treats the neural component, we also need to leave room for treating maybe the the conscious component. And even if... Well, that's neural too, but it's a different... Uh, it's a right, different it's a thought. different realm <laughs> uh, to anticipate where we're going. But Freud, I mean, developed a model that's today, I mean, people still practice psychoanalysis, but they practice many different sorts of psychoanalysis and their psychodynamic psychotherapy. But he's sort of the route for talk therapy. Okay, great. And I, 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 the reason that I was wanting to connect it to music is I, so I've been listening to the amygdaloids the past couple of days, your bands, uh, your band. I mean, I just was listening. I'm checking my iTunes. I was just listening to the EP anxious. And before that I was listening to, Oh, I accidentally just pressed play to theory of my mind. And I, I was just w wondering whether or not you, well, one, whether or not you'd been analyzed, but the so it sounds like no, but whether uh, your, yeah, your better understanding of yourself that might have come from therapy came out in your songwriting at all. But. Well, I think anytime you write anything, you learn something about yourself. Um, but I haven't, you know, I've never been in 
extensive uh, therapy. I had some uh, uh, one uh, bout with uh, some sort of um, uh, you know meditation stuff for a while. Just try to pick up, pick up a bit of that. Uh, and I did, you know, to just kind of relax a little bit because life can be tense sometimes. And uh, even for people who study anxiety, it can be tense. So um, I found that helpful. Hmm. Well, m moving on then from, from psychoanalysis, before we get started on, on the meat of your new theory of being human, I wanted to ask about something in the preface where you write that all of our conscious thoughts, including those about our mind, are preceded by pre-conscious. I think you say unconscious, oh no, better yet, pre-conscious cognitive processes. And this reminded me of something that recently came up in a discussion I had on the show with Michael Graziano of Princeton that I've been puzzling over. And this was a couple of months ago, so I might not have his words right, in, in which case... Uh, I'm the one that's responsible for any errors. But I think he said the, the very fact that we believe we are conscious stems from some pre-conscious bundle of information in our brain saying that we are and toward which our attention turns. And does this resonate with you and what you write in your introduction? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, just imagine now for a second, um, we've been talking I don't think either one of us has been like seriously planning the words that are coming out, um, but they are coming out in a fairly coherent way. And that's all our pre-conscious states generating that kind of, uh, you know, stuff that, that in behavior and speech and so forth, but also in our conscious, they generate our conscious experience as well. But we, we'll get to that at the uh, towards the end, I guess, when we talk about, I have this idea of these two mental models that are involved. One is non-conscious and one is conscious, but maybe we're jumping the gun there. Yeah, sure. Well, then let's uh, start with the four realms of existence. And maybe I should just ask you, to, I mean, before we dive into each one specifically, what the four are uh, quite broadly and what the theory is. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's not a theory. Uh, the publisher kind of insisted in putting the word theory in the title. I wanted framework or something like that. So that's too boring. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't, I don't, first of all, I just don't necessarily think it's a theory. It's a kind of more of a, a framework where I've assembled a lot of information. I mean, the book started with my um, feeling that ideas like self and personality were getting in the way of a lot of progress uh, in the field that, you know, if we, there's so much controversy about what the self is and, you know, personality has also been questioned. You know, there, you can look up quotes from people about these two and you'll find a bunch of people that say that they are illusions, they're made up, they're not real. And I certainly feel that about, that, about, about self, that it is, there's no additional thing besides you in you that is you. There's no other thing that we call a self that lives in you. Now, some people talk about self as a kind of agent in you, but I, I just don't think that's valuable. Um, you are the one that's doing what you do. The only like account of self that I um, like or you know sort of adhere to is the self. I don't know if you can see my shirt. Each every time I make a, I have a book lately. I make a T-shirt, and this one is "Yourself as a Story." The other one was the last book was um, no self, no fear, but uh, this is yourself as the stories. So it's a narrative that you generate about yourself that helps you understand yourself. I, this is a divergence, but it goes back to the, all this goes back to um, the work I did as a graduate student uh, uh, with Mike Sanaga on split brain patients. Uh, can I talk about that a minute and then we'll come please, back to the four Please, rooms. I mean, that's end of Maybe we'll run out of time. <laughs> so, uh, in graduate school, I had two degrees in marketing start for starter, uh, starters, and um, I didn't like really what I was doing. Uh, so I started taking psych courses and ended up taking a course with a guy who was studying the brain in rats. This was at uh, Louisiana State University in the late 60s. And he, um, I, I, so that was the first time I really had the idea that you could actually study the brain. I, you know, I didn't know anything about it coming from a small town in Louisiana. And 
so I decided that's what I wanted to do. And so I applied to a bunch of graduate schools and I got in at Stony Brook where I met Mike Kazanica. Um, it was a time when, you know, you didn't, I had no training at all, really no scientific training, no courses in science or anything like that, except a little bit of psychology. Um, but it was a time when you didn't have to know that much because neuroscience was brand new and they were looking for students. So I was able to slip in at that time. Uh, but we were studying split brain patients, which were fascinating. These are people that have epilepsy so bad that at the time the medications weren't helping. So, uh, surgically you could separate the two hemispheres and that would somehow ameliorate some of the uh, uh, convulsions that resulted when the seizures jumped back and forth between the hemispheres. So um, the thing about split brain patients is that the left hemisphere with language can talk to you, but the right hemisphere with not much language can't do that. Um, so you don't really know too much about what's going on in the right hemisphere. But I just want to tell you about one experiment. So we flashed on the screen two stimuli simultaneously. And the left visual field was a picture of a snow scene. This, all this took place in uh, the hills of Vermont because uh, the surgeon was at Dartmouth at the time. So you got a snow scene on the left and a chicken claw on the right. So the left side of space goes to the right hemisphere right side of space goes to the left hemisphere. So the hands go out to point to what the left and right hemisphere saw. So the left hand points to a shovel, the right hand to a chicken. So you say, ask the patient, why'd you do that? He looks at his hands and he says, well, I saw a chicken claw. So I pointed to the chicken and you need a shovel to clean out the shed. So, that's the left hemisphere talking, and it's making up a story looking at what the two fingers are pointing to uh, that makes his behavior make sense. The left hemisphere didn't see the snow scene. It just confabulated chicken and claw, uh, chicken and shovel to go with the uh, 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 snow scene. So the, the point is that what we concluded from this is that, you know, this is not a necessarily a consequence of having your brain split apart. It's something we all do every day, all the time, that what consciousness does for us is make sense of our lives. Uh, it's a high level kind of operation that allows us to um, tell stories that, that make everything make sense. It puts it all together for us. So uh, in the case of um, um, a uh, split brain patient, you know, it's like making up a story based on unconscious information that's been generated behaviorally. But we, a lot of our behavior is generated unconsciously as well. And so at that night at the bar, we were chatting about all this and we were saying, well, you know, maybe what happens is that if you, you know, we all kind of believe we have some kind of free will or that we're in charge of at least some of the behaviors that we generate. So it can be kind of disturbing if you aren't in charge, you see yourself performing behaviors you aren't in charge of, and that maybe emotion systems are behaviors that might produce these kinds of behaviors um, uh, non-consciously and require some kind of dissonance reducing uh, explanation. So Mike was a good friend of Leon Festinger's at the time and the theory of cognitive dissonance, which I guess you're at Stanford, right? So you know all about cognitive dissonance. I think that's where they discovered it at the time. Um, the, um, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but anyway, that we, we produce these behaviors, cause dissonance, and we have to have some way to reduce the dissonance. And we do that by telling a story about why we did what we did. And, you know, you're having an argument with your, your uh, partner, let's say, and Often, um, this may ring, resonate with you, but sometimes you find that, you know, as the thing you're saying is coming out, you know it's not right, but it's too late. And so you either, you know, tell, you then start a narration where either you apologize or you stick with your guns. You know, it's just that kind of thing that's happening all the time. So, you know, I decided that what I wanted to do is um, study emotion and in particular, uh, brain systems that might operate non-consciously to control our behavior, our, our emotional behaviors, that in humans might cause these dissonance-reducing narratives to spin up. 
Um, so that's why I turned to rats and Pavlovian conditioning and spent, I don't know, 40 something years, maybe longer, um, uh, studying how the brain respond, detects and responds to danger. Okay. So I forget exactly. Oh, we're talking about self and so forth. So in self as a narrative, self as a story we tell about ourselves. All right. Then you asked about the four realms of existence. Um, so before we move um, on the, to that, the, I just, what I wanted to do. Yeah. Just to make sure that I uh, am following so far. So what came out of the split brain work was that our conception of the self is what arises out of this conscious narrating that helps us make sense of the world. Yes, yourself is a narration that you that's generated non-consciously by cognitive systems in your brain, putting a lot of stuff together. Um, um, and so I'm not, a, I, I think all of the stuff that's been discovered about as features of self and features of personality are important. But maybe these centuries old ideas that go all the way back to the ancient Greeks um, are not the best kind of uh, uh, concept or conception to hang all these facts upon. So what I wanted to do was to take all of this interesting and important stuff about who we are that's been discovered in the name of self and personality and repackage them into these four realms of existence. And that's, so that's what I did in the book. So the first realm is the biological realm. So the first realm is the biological realm. Everything that is living is a biological organism from the bacterial cell all the way through your cat and you and me and everything else that is living or has ever lived is a biological being. Now, some biological being, whether it's a single cell or a multi-cell organism, some biological beings um, develop nervous systems and that isolates animals as a group from all of the rest of life. Only animals have nervous systems. Um, so you take a plant, it doesn't have a nervous system. It can communicate between its roots and its leaves it can cause the leaves to, to move. It can, well, leaves can move into the sun or uh, other things. The roots can find, can behave by finding uh, liquids and, and nutrients, but those are very, very slow processes. A nervous system allows you to respond instantaneously to a stimulus. And that is the virtue of having a nervous system. You can move around in the world. You can respond to it very quickly. Um, and you, it's, it's very effective and efficient in avoiding danger and securing uh, nutrients to stay alive. So <clears throat> the, the nervous system, um, well, all of these realms I call, uh, I talk about as mirror realms. For example, the neurobiological realm, the mirror neurobiological means things that are only done neurobiologically. So for example, reflex, reflexes, habits and other kinds of automatic behaviors, fixed action patterns, uh, instincts. These are all controlled as stimulus response events. There's no uh, internal representation, no cognition involved, no consciousness is involved. So that's what I mean by the mere neurobiological realm. It controls your heartbeat, your breathing rate and sleep cycles and, and all of that stuff non-consciously and non-cognitively. So uh, the cognitive realm, though, is, and the conscious realm are both a little different. There are no um, physical markers that we can use. Biologically, we know that an organism is a biological organism because all organisms are. So if it's alive, it's biological. Neuro neurobiological, we have the nervous system to tell us which organisms are neurobiological uh, beings because if they have neurons, then they have, they're neurobiological beings. Um, but with cognition and consciousness, it's a little different. Um, the, um, there are no, you know, particular physical markers that unequivocally tell you this is cognition or this is consciousness. We have to use behavior. Now, when you use behavior, um, that means that you are using behavior to, uh, identify whether some process is cognitive or not. But that means you need a concept of what it is you think cognition is. So different people have different ideas about cognition. For some, it's in information processing. 
So you get a lot of invertebrate researchers who say that, you know, a grasshopper or a bee has cognition because they process information in complex ways. But it, this gets to the AI argument as well. So does an AI bot have cognition or does it just have information processing? And I would say it just has information processing. So I don't, I don't go with that, that definition of cognition as information processing because it's just too broad. Uh, and cognition itself, though, we could talk about uh, Kenneth Craik, who um, in the 1940s came up with, I think, a very good definition of cognition, but he didn't call it that at the time. Uh, what he was talking about is how some animals, let's say mostly mammals, I would say, um, have in their head a little internal representation of the outside world. And they use that representation to make decisions and guide their behavior and, um, and survive in a way that is much more sophisticated than you can without having a mental representation that allows you to flexibly control your behavior. For example, the difference between a goal-directed behavior, which is flexible, and a habit, which is inflexible and just triggered by a stimulus, is that goal-directed behavior involves a mental model. Now, uh, Nathaniel Daw um, and colleagues in the, the 1990s borrowed a, uh, a concept or a way of talking from machine learning called um, uh, <clears throat> model-based and model-free learning. And so in model-free learning, you, have, you don't have a middle model, you just have these automatic processes. Whereas model-based learning, um, you do have these internal representations. So for me, cognition is the use of internal representations to create mental models to control behavior. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's pretty straightforward. It's, I wouldn't think that that's controversial, but some people would want a broader definition. Um, but I think their broad definition gets subsumed within my mere neurobiological realm if you're just talking about information processing. So, you know, that's why I like these, these four realms, because it does give us partitions, very hard, defined, well-defined partitions of, of behavior, uh, behaviors that are merely neurobiological, behaviors that are merely cognitive, and some are conscious. So within, you know, one of the things I did in the cognitive realm was to take on the, uh, <clears throat> the topic of, you know, the Kahneman fast and and slow thinking uh, process. Um, so Danny Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winner, psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in economics, had this uh, two kind of front, two system cognition thing going where he talked about there are things that are very fast and things that are more deliberative and slow. So the, the, the fast system, uh, I guess that was system one for him, uh, <clears throat> is includes all kinds of processes that allow you to respond quickly, uh, whereas the slow system requires working memory and it's more deliberative and internal involves mental models and so forth. Um, but I'm saying mental models, he didn't say that in, in his book. So um, the problem with that is a lot of the stuff in his um, system two, the, the slow one, can be broken up into two kinds of categories. One is um, conscious and cognitive. So it's, it's both conscious and cognitive, but the other is cognitive, but not conscious. So when we talk about mental models, we're not talking about consciousness, we're talking about unconscious processes that can control goal-directed behavior independent of whether or not those cross the consciousness finishing line and you're aware of what's going on. So we have a lot of complex behavior that we can do non-consciously, driving down the road and you know thinking about something else. And then all of a sudden something jumps out and you like grab hold and, and take conscious control over it. Uh, but a lot of behavior can be controlled non-consciously through cognition. So I, I, what I do in the, in the book is to divide um, the, the uh, slow system into two systems. One is cognitive and one is conscious. Uh, they're both cognitive, but sorry, but one of them is conscious and one is not. So we've got conscious and cognitive, 
we have cognitive, but not conscious. So those, that's the top levels. Uh, then in the system one, the lower system that's fast, there are a lot of fast processes that are uh, just reflexive, automatic, and not cognitive. So we add a, a not cognitive and um, uh, we add a, just a pure not cognitive category down there. But we can also have an, uh, a, 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 a cognitive category that is separate from that reflexes. So you got reflexes, you got non-conscious cognition, then you have uh, con conscious cognition, and then you have consciousness. Those are the four categories. So we start from the top, consciousness, which is cognitive, non-conscious, but cognitive, cognitive, but not conscious down here, and then uh, automatic or not cognitive. So I, <laughs> that was a little confusing, I guess, but uh, those are the four categories that we can divide behavior into across all of, um, all of animals. So um, it, it allows you to say, if a given behavior, it, it gives you some kind of guideposts for deciding whether a behavior is um, in the ballpark of cognition or not reflexes, anything that's habitual and reflexive is neurobiological and not in the cognitive realm. Cognitive realm responses are cognitive, they involve mental models, but they aren't conscious. And then into the, the conscious realm, we have uh, conscious processes that are cognitive, but you could also have some that are not cognitive. For example, uh, what, what some people call phenomenal consciousness or, um, you know, or sentience and other things like that. Okay. Well, that, no, that was not confusing at all. It was all great. There all, I have a couple of anecdotes or comments to make, and then maybe we can, we'll move on. But the first is that uh, Danny Kahneman was on the show uh, a few months or so ago. And it was one of my, I think, big failures as an interviewer because I had, planned on, he was great but i had planned on interviewing him about thinking fast and slow so that's what i read and and prepared for but then the day before or so uh he told me that he wanted to talk about noise which is his book with Cass sunstein and i just didn't i didn't have time to prepare for it and it was a pretty uh in-depth book and i sh probably should have tried to re tried to reschedule uh, but I did my best. I think it still came out pretty well. And I read the book afterward and it was great. But I, I yeah, I mean, if you have you, a new I book, mean, that's what you want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Not a book that you wrote 20 years ago. And I probably should have been thinking about it, but I th should have realized that. But I, I just wanted to ask about one detail of what you were saying, because it's a, a topic du jour and just interesting, even if it's orthogonal to the four realms, but you said that you don't think of cognition as information processing and AIs do not have cognition because cognition involves mental models. But to me, it seems like using the word mental is just precluding AI in itself since we don't think of AI as mental and then mental state language uh, is pretty contentious and vexed in itself. But I can imagine an AI that does generate a couple of models and then select one that is more closely aligned with its goal. A self-driving vehicle seems like something that might be doing this. So I'm wondering if you have maybe more, a, more of an explicit way of differentiating between information processing and cognition that might preclude what a self-driving vehicle is doing. Right. So, you know, I guess I can back off a little bit on, on what I said about that, because, you know, I think the, the biggest problem with AI is not cognition so much as consciousness. And, and we can talk about that later. But, but I, you know, I think that you have very sophisticated information processing in AI. There's no doubt about that. And if... Um, if that is the, you know, we can probably call that cognitive, some of that cognitive. You can, they create probably 
internal machine models of the world and use those to reference and and so I'll, I'll back off on that and, and limit my concerns of AI with consciousness, um, if that makes sense. No, I'm 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 perfectly happy with that. And in the end, uh, I think it's fair to say that cognition is just a word, and it can mean whatever we want it to mean. Right. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. But all these things to... are words: emotions, cognition, mind. Mm -hmm. Before we start at the beginning, because I'd like to start with the the biological, I wanted to clarify. So it, this is not a theory, it's a framework. And the main purpose other than uh, other than other than, I mean, clarifying some confusions around old and archaic terminology, maybe that we've inherited like self and, and personality. So the framework gives us a way for categorizing all human behavior so we can label whether this is biological or neural or cognitive or conscious and it, this is more the purpose than trying to establish some hierarchy of reduction and argue that it's not an argument about whether consciousness is biological even if that's what you believe that's just not the purpose of this framework well it's not the purpose of the framework but i would definitely say it's biological. <laughs> I mean, I do say that in the book, so I'm not going to back off on that. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I wasn't asking you to back off on that. Uh, but, okay. <laughs> this also might be a little bit orthogonal, but aside from biology on Earth, do you have any thoughts on how we ought to think about what makes something alive versus not alive? Or biological versus not biological right that's that's what the uh, the whole biological realm part is about and you know it, there there have been lots of uh, uh, ink spilt over exactly what an organism is I mean organisms are biological beings um, and you so if you define an organism as something that has a beginning uh, that grows through its own processes its own initiative uh, changes over time repairs itself uh, in injury um, is able to interact with the world and at some point will run out of steam and die. So some of those features you would put into a machine, right? It, it has a beginning and it ends. The beginning of a machine though is always uh, built by another agent, right? It's not it's spontaneously arise and it's not gonna spontaneously grow uh, unless you've, you've programmed it to do that, but that's somebody programming it to, to do it. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, the other thing is the way an organism does all those things. It has its own energy source, its own energy machine, metabolism. Uh, it needs energy from the outside to sustain that that uh, oven. But uh, you have an oven that keeps your your uh, system uh, percolating along day to day, as long as you keep giving it the uh, you know the nutrients that it needs to do that. Uh, and an organism replicates, self-replicates, which is a very important thing. So you need metabolism for the existence of life, but you need replication for the persistence of life. Hmm. Uh, and self-replication, not, not... Do you know the name Michael Levin by any chance? He's at Tufts? Uh, sounds familiar, but I don't know if I... Maybe thinking of a different level. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was what, on, what's, uh, on the show recently, and he does some very interesting work on synthetic biology and synthetic life and, and cognition. And one of the way, ways that he thinks about life is that all life is is solving problems. And it's not just solving problems on one scale, but life, living things, at least as we know them, have multi-scale competence hierarchies. So, I mean, at 
humans, for instance, on, on one level, we're driving cars. Another level, we have organs that are figuring out pumping blood. And another level, we have cells that are replicating, doing all sorts of things. And I think that's a, a neat way of looking at life as well. Right, but that only works for uh, a multicellular organism. Organism, um, You have to account for a bacterial cell, single cell microbes as well, uh, when you talk about that. But they too are machines that are solving problems all day. Uh, you know, it's just life is a uh, life is a problem and you have to, to sustain it. You have to solve the problem continuously. Mm -hmm. Well, bacteria, I think, still have these multi-scale problems in that one, maybe they're uh, hunting around for other bacteria to eat. And then inside of the cell, they have to deal with replication. And I mean, there are things going on at, at different scales still. Right. So, you know, it turns out that bacteria are not predators. Um, they don't, at least the, in the research I did for my other book, Deep History, the Deep History of Our Cells, um, the first predators were eukaryotes. Um, and eukaryotes, you know, were a combination of two kinds of bacteria, like a, a plastic bacterial cell and then an archaebacterial cell, where the archaebacterial or archaea cell either sucked in or allowed in a bacterial cell and the bacterial cell of the archaea inside the archaea became the mitochondria of the energy machine and that was the process through which eukaryotes came to exist and eukaryotes we can thank for two things one is uh, sex because they were the first sexually reproducing organisms another was death because bacterial cells just continuously divide so it's been said the first bacterial cell ever is still part of every bacterial cell alive today. Whereas eukaryotes uh, didn't just split in half, they generated a, uh, you know, they had a fertilized egg that generated another bacteria, another eukaryotic cell. So they gave a sex and death, but they were the first predators. They would, you know, eat other eukaryotes and uh, plants and other things and, and bacteria. So. Uh, at least that's my understanding of that. No, that that's really interesting. I, the inner contrarian in me wanted to start arguing immediately and say that. I mean, I've read the self the selfish gene, and and that always is an example that comes to mind. And the this idea that the first or the the predecessors of living things were just very complicated molecules in the that primordial ooze that were sort of acquiring other molecules. But then I realized, oh, wait, a predator has to be consuming something that's alive. And so this doesn't count at all. But okay. Okay. <laughs> so moving on to the neural realm, and this you've already discussed a bit, but maybe just to rehash, the overall function of neural tissue is is it to orchestrate movement overall or just more broadly orchestrate the cooperation of different parts within an extended multicellular macroscopic, maybe macroscopic creature? So we need to go back to the uh, biological realm to understand this because the biological realm in fact, all realms after the biological realm as well, have two critical kind of partitions. One is what we could call uh, visceral. In other words, the metabolism and other stuff happening internally within the cell. And another somatic, which would be the interaction of the outside of the cell wall with the external environment. Now, when animals evolved out of um, uh, biological realm organisms in, in particular in out of uh, multicellular, well not multicellular, but uh, uh, from, let's, let's take animals. So animals evolved out of protozoa. Uh, so protozoa are single cell eukaryotes, um, but they would form colonies 
and those colonies would cling together. And to do that, they used adhesion molecules. So the clinging together um, of cells could happen in two ways. One is that it's cells that have come to be as a, uh, as a result of different mother cells, just to use the, not to be sexist, but the mother cells, as it's called in the literature, um, um, or one mother cell that has, that generates the same DNA for all of the other cells. So the, if you have a, uh, a colony made up of cells that are all of the same DNA, that is the, the pathway to multicellularity. Now, I'm not gonna try to explain how that happens from single cell to multi-cell, uh, from single cell colonies to multi-cell organisms. It's just, it would take all day. Uh, and it took me like maybe a year to figure it out when I was trying to write about it in that book. Um, so let's just say that protozoa are the base of the, uh, the, multi the single cell basis of animals. Um, there's a kind of algae that's the single cell basis of plants. And uh, I forget what the uh, kind of uh, amoeba that's the basis of the of fungi. Those are the three kinds of multicellular organisms. So when you go from single cell to multicell, the visceral and somatic functions are carried forward, forward from the biological realm to well, not from the, into plants and fungi, it, they're still biological. Let's, let's go to animals. So when you go from the uh, protozoa to animals, the visceral and somatic functions are carried forward into the first animals, sponges, basically. And the sponges, present day sponges don't have nervous systems, but it's been strongly suggested that they had it at one point but because of their sessile life, they just didn't need it. And so, it, you know, things get ditched all the time in evolution, it's not necessarily working. But the components, the thing that, uh, that the, the genes that allowed them to have a nervous system were passed on to the next level, which were jellyfish-like animals. Uh, and they, in fact, did have a nervous system uh, and still do. So in the genes that are going into from protozoa to, to sponges to jellyfish, what you're doing is hanging on to functions, gene functions that were old and sending them in to, uh, into the future. And some of those get kept and others get discarded. So some of those allowed um, uh, cells to cling together because of the adhesion molecules that colonies use to cling together and which had been used for something else even earlier. So the clinging together allowed neurons, it had allowed cells to stick together, but then to spread apart a little bit and to, to st have protrusions that come out that would then stick up to the cell, the distal cell and event and longer and longer protrusions. Um, and also, something that was carried forward was the ability to gen generate electrical sparks uh, in the in the biology of, of these single cell organisms. So action potentials first arose in, um, I think it might've, it's either in an early eukaryote or a prokaryote, I'm not sure. But in, in single cell organisms as a means to repair the cell wall if it's damaged. So if a cell, has a damaged area of the cell wall, it's at risk of either collapsing from all of the stuff coming out, going out of the, the uh, cell membrane, or exploding by stuff coming too much coming in and, and making it blow up. So it's very important to repair the cell wall. And if you can have molecules that, are, that will generate an electric spark near the injury, that can attract nutrients and be used to rebuild the cell wall. So that is believed to be the basis of electrical signaling uh, in organisms. You know, there are many, many organisms have, or, have uh, electrical signaling, but in the nervous, in, in animals, again, they co-opted adhesion 
and electrical signaling to create to start creating a nervous system. And of course, the first nervous systems were uh, div uh, kind of diffuse things. There were neurons all over the place, and they were kind of randomly connected. You know, you touch a jellyfish on one side, and the whole body moves. So they didn't have control over specific functions so much. But as the as organisms evolved uh, from the jellyfish, more complicated forms of interactions took place, so that you could have um, localized responses. So uh, if you touch the body here, that part could withdraw and not the whole body having to withdraw. Um, but you could also control uh, um, whole body movements and locomotion that way. But the other thing you have to control if you are a multicellular organism is um, the inner functions that keep all of the cells working properly. I mean, each cell has its own homeostasis within the, the neuron itself, right? But you also have to have homeostasis across all of the neurons. So you have this visceral function uh, and feeding. Feeding is a visceral function. So multicellular organisms have to take in a lot of uh, nutrients in order to keep the, the engine going. Um, so feeding became a very crucial vis uh, visceral function inherited from you know, these uh, single cell organisms and turned into part of the machinery of the nervous system that allows metabolism to keep the organism alive. And the somatic, the outside somatic interaction with the environment became internalized with neurons controlling different body parts to allow the animal to move externally uh, and in the, the quest to capture uh, food uh, and to avoid danger. So the biological realm passed on these visceral and somatic functions to the neurobiological realm, allowing the biological organism to survive more effectively by having the ability to respond quickly and efficiently and in an organized, complicated way. That was a great story. So I forget what your and, question was, but that was that's the answer. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the stories of co-opting and evolution are are so amazing, and I mean the adhesion molecules, the spark generations for repair. So thanks, thanks so much for sharing those. One, well, I guess there are two lingering questions before we move on, and one is where the what the big change is in vertebrates. And then more particularly, what distinguishes, I mean, there are lots of things, but human brain, since this is a story about the, the, the human body, what, di what differentiates human brains from those of other, like our closest relatives? So, yeah, I feel I need to put some stuff in between that, if, if you don't, if you don't mind. I don't because mind we, when we go from, we need to, <laughs> when we go from jellyfish to you know, jellyfish are not bilateral organisms. They're radial, so to speak. Um, but all, most of the the animals that we live amongst are radial, left, right, front, back, you know, and so forth, top, bottom. So uh, jellyfish only have a top and a bottom. You know, they're not, they don't have a front and a back, um, or, or left and right. So the, the first organism that had a radio body was a, a, a flatworm that lived about 630 million years ago. And that gave rise to two lines of descent. Uh, also, the flatworm had a, a, you know, a little nervous, had a little concentration of neurons in its head. It had a front and a back, and so the head was there. And so the nervous system went to the head because if, if the worm is trying to get away, the tail will be the first thing that's attacked from a predator coming from behind and saving the nervous system and its ability to control the whole body. Uh, you know, it had a nerve net that went down to the whole body. So you had centralized control over the, the various legs or whatever was going on and ability to move in the world. Uh, and the, the head is up there so the predator can only get the tail. Um, so this flatworm then gave rise to one lineage that became the uh, protosomes which are all of the invertebrate organisms that that, uh, that we know and love, octopus and um, you know, uh, various kinds of uh, bugs and so forth and bees and all of that. Uh, and then 
The other line also gave rise to some invertebrates, but these were um, the, the invertebrates that then gave rise to vertebrates. Uh, and those invertebrates that gave rise to the vertebrates are kind of interesting. There were the, the protostome deuterostome difference is protostomes have the um, the mouth opens first in the digestive tract and the anus opens last. Whereas in deuterostomes, the anus opens first and then the mouth opens later. So it's an embryological distinction that goes all the way back to that divergent 630 million years ago. Um, the, but it's important because that allows us to see to see how and why certain things happen in the developing embryo in terms of, you know, the anus goes first and then the mouth and all that. Uh, but anyway, so the the first vertebrates, of course, were fish. And they uh, the first fish didn't have a, a skeleton. They had a uh, a cartilage skeleton rather than a bony skeleton. Um, and one of the, the, I guess one of the earliest living fishes uh, now is the uh, uh, lamprey. Uh, I visited Sten Grillner in Stockholm, um, who studied lamprey all, all his life. Uh, and they're really fascinating kind of little creatures. Um, they survive many, many, many things. I mean, they, they're kind of like the bacteria of vertebrates. Uh, bacteria you know, have been around the whole time and probably will always be around. We're going to kill ourselves off. Bacteria will survive. Maybe the lamprey will too, because they've managed to go for a long time. So the lamprey were, the, were an early fish and then came bony fish later, the kind of fish we normally buy in the supermarket and stuff. And, um, so they have what we're what we're dealing with here are organisms at this point that are all neurobiological realm uh, organisms. They can they have reflexes, they have uh, motor programs that control complicated behaviors, motor patterns. Um, they can learn habits and control them. Their brain has essentially every major part that the human brain later has, um, not in terms of details, but in terms of the forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. Uh, the, the lamprey has a basal ganglia, it has an amygdala, it has a, uh, a, a neocortex, it has all of the major components. They're, they're pretty primitive, but you know, uh, this is all based on genetic analyses of what the, you know, the genetic uh, kind of foundation of all of these structures. Uh, and you can find the genes for the amygdalin cortex and all that, uh, and hypothalamus, and basal ganglia. So the part of the basal ganglia that's there though is relatively primitive. And what it can do is learn a habit, a stimulus response habit by the release of dopamine onto sensory motor cells that are converging in the basal ganglia and then coming back to the sensory motor cortex of the cortex um, and allow the animal to form a stimulus response habit. So when the sensory system sees the thing that it has been conditioned, uh, the animal will automatically produce that reaction to that stimulus. So um, <clears throat> goal-directed behavior though, takes a little while longer to, to come in. Uh, it seems that that probably did not happen uh, in the lion going towards humans until uh, the arrival of mammals. So in mammals, uh, we know from a lot of work that uh, they can learn goal-directed behaviors, uh, which requires not just a stimulus and not just the release of dopamine, uh, but it requires a more complicated set of, of computations. And for that, at the the ability to form the goal-directed behaviors involved an expansion of the basal ganglia to like not just the reptilian part but now a new part that could do you know they still have the reptilian habit system all mammals do but evolution then adds on to that but you know it's kind of like a an expansion it's like the biological realm expands and the neurobiological the habit system expands to allow the goal-directed system to 
uh, evolve step by step. Of course, it didn't just happen. There's like lots and lots of steps that went from habits to goal directed behavior, but eventually it worked out in early mammals and that was passed on to other mammals and on down the line. So we have behaviors that are beginning to be more complicated. They involve the holding of information on, in mind about the last state of a reinforcer, not uh, in other words, the present value of the reinforcer, rather than a whole, rather than the uh, 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 that that doesn't cause the response to be released, it then just enables the response to be released in the presence of that stimulus. But decisions have to be made about you know what to do and how to do it. So Bernard Bailey and and uh, Anthony Dickinson at Cambridge worked out all these differences between habits and goal-directed behaviors. You know, Dickinson early on said that if you look at a habit, or if you see an animal, let's say a rodent, uh, performing a, a, an instrumental behavior, you can't tell if that's a habit or a goal-directed behavior from observation alone, because they look exactly the same. The only way to know what's going on is to perform very sophisticated experiments where you devalue the reinforcer. So the main difference between the hab the main difference between a habit and a goal directed behavior is that um, if the animal learned a habit, then it's uh, it is uh, it will respond regardless of whether the reinforcer is still valuable to it. But if the animal has learned a goal-directed behavior, it will no longer respond to the stimulus um, uh, because it is no longer valuable to it. And the way those values are inserted is by giving drugs that make the animal sick. The key in the goal-directed thing is though, the, it's not like the animal's not made sick right afterwards, it's made sick some hours left afterwards, maybe four or five hours. And so the pairing of the, the nausea from being sick with the stimulus is something that is not an immediate stimulus, but something that happened four hours ago. So it's the pairing of an aversive feeling in the body with the um, value that existed four hours ago, but now persist in memory. So it's all about having a memory that you can use to decide whether the current, stim the current uh, stimulus is valuable to you or not. Okay. So that's the difference between habits and goal-directed behavior. So all mammals can do that, but it's not clear that other uh, vertebrates can, except birds. Now, birds and mammals can do a lot of very sophisticated things. And it's been, you know, the question is, why birds and mammals? What's the, the connection? Well, it turns out that, you know, birds and mammals are the only two kinds of organisms, only two animals, that are warm-blooded. Well, why does that matter? Okay. Well, if you're warm-blooded, that means you've got a you know an oven in you that is keeping your body warm 24/7, maintaining a body temperature. Now, there's you know bees and some other things can have some kind of temporary warm-bloodedness, but it's not the same thing at all. So, to do that, you need a, a heck of a lot of food to keep the engine going. You can't, you can't let that engine go down. Um, it's got to stay hot to maintain that constant temperature. So birds and mammals have to forage for food and they have to be very careful of how they do it. So they have to have some sense of the season. You know, you can't go to the place where the, you got the food in the summer in the middle of the winter because it's going to be too hard and uh, it's probably not going to be there anyway. So you have to like shop for food today based on the weather today and your or your anticipation of the weather that you can have some sense of that you know the weather is going to change so you got to do it quickly or wait till a little while and lots of decisions can be made that are that are very important um, but if you don't if you don't plan properly uh, if you screw it up then you know you're not going to have food and so you won't be able to maintain that that warm bloodedness so it's all about warm bloodedness being the reason that planning exists because you you have to be able to plan complex ways and be very efficient in your foraging at least that's the the idea behind why they might be both uh, warm blooded yeah so that uh, that takes us into the the cognitive realm and uh, takes us 
further into the cognitive realm and, and how all of that works. So, you know, I, again, I like to talk about the cognitive realm in terms of these mental models and this internal representation of a reinforcer is a good example of a mental model. These mental models are not necessarily conscious. Um, we don't know, you know, what kind of consciousness, if any other animals besides us have, but I'm willing to say they likely have something similar uh, to at least some kinds of consciousness we have. Um, so maybe we should then jump to the conscious realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy skipping over the cognitive realm, but I have one broader, maybe more more philosophical question. That when we were talking earlier about AI information processing and 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 grasshoppers, just a little bit, it it came to me that the upshot is that consciousness and cognition are at least in principle substance neutral. But when we talk about the neural level, I'm wondering whether this level is sort of stipulated to refer exclusively to the particular sort of biological structure that emerged from co-opting these spark generating mechanisms so that an AI just does not have a neural level, though it might have some sorts of analogous structures like circuits that go circuits that govern movement or would you want to call this neural as well i mean maybe all four of these realms are substance neutral and we can imagine silicone based things that exhibit all of them but it just happens to be that only humans uh, on earth exhibit them in the sorts of ways that uh, you write about at this point in time mm -hmm. you know I, I mean at the end of the book i write about the what I think it took to make human consciousness and the reason why AI will never be conscious, which is that it was billions and billions of years of accidental biological events that led to the first, the, arri the, the arrival of, of uh, prokaryotes from proto cells that were just these, you know, not quite real cells and so forth. Um, so there were lots of accidents that happened that never led to anything, but there was some accident that had the mojo that allowed that organism to survive, that single cell organism to survive long enough to divide and start giving rise to the rest of, of life. Um, but to do that, it had to be able to do some things. It had to be able to detect danger and acquire nutrients um, because, uh, you know, bacterial cell doesn't live that long uh, before dividing and going on, but it has to live long enough. And if they're, if the, the, pre the dangers for them were not predators so much as toxins in the environment. So if there's, if you are a bacterial cell and you hit an area where there's a very high concentration of acid, that is not a favorable environment to be in. So they have these detectors on their surface that allow them to move away, spin away. Uh, from toxic elements and go in another direction. They're constantly moving nonstop. They don't sleep, obviously. They just move nonstop in their environment in a random fashion. If they come to toxins, they move away. If they come to nutrients, they continue. And it's as simple um, as that. So the, um, the, the accidents that led to bacterial cells and the accidents that then led to these archaeal cells and the accidents that led to the incorporation of the bacterial cell into the archaeal cell to give rise to eukaryotes and to different kinds of eukaryotes and from eukaryotes to multicellular prokaryotes and from multicellular, sorry, multicellular eukaryotes, including animals, plants, and fungi, and then ultimately to us and the animal one. Not, that doesn't mean we're the end point, certainly not. We're gonna, you know, I think we're gonna go pretty soon and then something else will uh, keep going. But the, the point is that the, all, of this, all of these accidents are what made us conscious. One, one little accident not happening might've prevented the whole thing from happening. So I think when, when you talk about, you know, something in a, a set of, you know, logic gates or chips or circuits or whatever, electronic circuits, um, you can create, you know, the, the map of the brain, the map of the neurons in the brain. But even if you do that, that's, that's, and the connections between them, but that's not 
what's important. Those are just the superficial kind of, you know, thing on top. It's like the Freud's tip of the iceberg, you know, everything else is underneath. You got all those molecules that are sustaining metabolism and without metabolism and all of that, that life generating stuff, it's not going to be the same thing. You know, I think it's, uh, we, we can mimic AI pretty carefully and pretty you know, effectively like chat will, you know, apologize to you if it makes a mistake. Um, so, but that's not, that doesn't mean there's someone home there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that makes complete sense to me, but okay. So we, do, we, we have like 13 minutes to get, to get to the, the fourth and most important realm. And so I don't know where, where you'd like to begin with that, but you mentioned at the beginning that you have two hypotheses or two theories, and I'm guessing that one is the multi-state hierarchical higher order theory of consciousness. So I don't know if that's where you'd like to start or where, but I'm, I'm all ears. Yeah. Okay. But no, it's not, I don't have two theories. I have two mental models, not in my head, but in, in my head, but uh, in, in the, uh, in the brain. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, you know, I think the, an important point to start with is um, the notion of qualia, which philosophers have given us and David Chalmers and in, in particular has talked about the hard problem. But, you know, David is a philosopher. Uh, the hard problem for him is a hard problem because he's a dualist and a panpsychist. He's not a physicalist. He doesn't believe that consciousness is a feature of the brain. It's, it's something else. So he says, yeah, the brain does all that easy stuff, but consciousness is this otherworldly kind of thing. And I'm not using the words he would use probably, but I think you get the point that I'm making. The problem is that he encouraged, I don't know if he encouraged, but somehow the qualia thing and the, the heart problem has been adopted by neuroscientists as if, you know, okay, we have to solve the heart problem. But the heart problem was created in a way that it can never be solved. It's not physical. If it's not physical, you can't study it scientifically, right? So <laughs> I think it's, it's just a, you know, it's the wrong, it's the wrong, uh, it's a dead end. It's the wrong approach. So you know, I think I like to think about it as, um, you know, what can we solve? You know, a lot of people want to solve the problem of, of animal consciousness, but we only know consciousness for real exists in humans. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist in other animals, but it, we're guessing. And it's like the difference between goal-directed behavior and, and habits. They look exactly the same on the outside, uh, but on the inside, something different goes on. And I think that's the same between, say, cognition and consciousness. They look the same. The behaviors look the same on the outside, but they're different things that are going on in, in consciousness. And the way I like to, you know, I, I like to jump away from the, the word consciousness because that assumes that there's one thing called consciousness. And I don't think that's the case. And uh, I like partitions, you know, I'm a splitter uh, kind of guy. And so I use Endel Talving's uh, partition of autonoetic, noetic, and anoetic consciousness. Uh, because I think that lever that gives us some, some leverage for understanding how different animals, different mammals in particular, might be conscious in ways that we are, uh, even if we can't say for sure that they are. If we could find the neural basis, if we understood better the neural basis of those three kinds of consciousness in the human brain, <clears throat> we could kind of uh, retrofit in a reverse engineering way, if an animal has this kind of circuitry, then it might have that kind of consciousness. So for the three conscious types of consciousness, if we start with anoetic, that is a the, the raw feeling you have of being who you are. So let's say you walk into your apartment, you don't have to say, oh, this is my apartment. You're just, you know it's yours because you've been there many times and you've learned what it's like and it, it just it's just your apartment. It's the same with your whole being. You know what it's like to be you, what it feels like, what your aches and pains are like, whether some of those rise to the level of concern or, or that it's just all your body. If you think about it, you can like, you know, if you do yoga or something or meditation, you meditate on your body parts, you can actually like, you know, attend to what's going on in all those different parts, but you don't normally do that. You don't have to, uh, unless you're focused to do it, you know, if you're doing it for some reason, but normally you're just, they're just there. And that is 
what you are at a very fringe consciousness level. It's like at the, at the minimal edge of what's conscious and what's not conscious. So uh, again, you go into your house, everything, you, you don't have to say it's mine because it, it just is. But if you see some books that are knocked off the shelf or chairs are, you know, this mess, chairs are turned over and things are in a, a, a mess, then all of a sudden you've moved into noetic consciousness, which is conceptual semantic knowledge of, of the world and, and your understanding of it. And all of a sudden, you know that that is not right. Uh, and that moves you then into uh, the third kind, autonoetic, which is self-awareness. And you become aware, self-aware that something is, has happened to you and you begin to worry, you have fear, you have anxiety, you're, you're concerned about why all this happened and what it is. So those are the three kinds of, of consciousness that Talvin uh, proposed. And the advantage of them is that each is based on a kind of memory. Autonoetic consciousness, self-awareness is based on episodic memory. Semantic conceptual consciousness is based on semantic conceptual memory. And auto, uh, anoetic consciousness is based on procedural memory. Now, this is, you, you might be thinking, well, how can you have a consciousness that's based on an unconscious memory. Procedural memory is unconscious, right? Non-conscious. So that bugged me for a long time. So in deep history, I didn't write about anoetic, but I did some additional reading and talking to people and uh, uh, talking to Talving. And I came to understand that anoetic is not, uh, is this more, this fringe state. It's not a pure, content rich kind of consciousness. It's just this fringe feeling of right and everything is okay. Uh, or if it's not, then you, you, you get that kind of discordance and that bumps you up to the noetic level. So a noetic is, I think really, really important because I think that is the, the, what philosophers often talk about is phenomenal consciousness. That's where the quality are. That's that essence of what it feels like because every noetic state, includes an anoetic component and every autonoetic state includes both an anoetic and a noetic component so it's a hierarchy of of components that are are uh, uh building up and and you know you only use what you need in a given kind of situation for self-awareness you need all three uh but for feeling of rightness you only need that, that one so i think these this is an important way to think about uh you know we can retro retrofit uh, self-awareness, if we can get better understanding of that, we can retrofit noetic awareness, which I think is kind of working memory, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We can you know, retrofit that into monkeys and, and other primates, but not into rats because they don't have dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. But all mammals have medial prefrontal cortex where I think the anoetic comes in. And so that's why we can share that across all mammals as a kind of consciousness. So I think it's important to to try to understand mammalian consciousness. Uh, a lot of people are interested in you know, all the other kinds of animals, but at least we have some grounding, uh, anatomical and conceptual understanding from our kind of consciousness, what might be going on in, in mammals that we can't possibly have in an octopus or you know, grasshopper or anything else be. So um, let me br just briefly talk about my dual mental model thing. The the Bhakti state hierarchical uh, model is that we just need, you know, the, the traditional models involve typically visual cortex and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in consciousness debates. But I think that's way, way too, um, too crude. We need more anatomical sophistication uh, about what prefrontal cortex does. You know, I my, I, I am a prefrontal cortex uh, proponent of, uh, for consciousness um, because I think we can get those three kinds of consciousness uh, working there uh, and, and extrapolate them. Um, but to do that, we have to have a much richer understanding of what's going on. So if you just take dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, it's not just getting sensory information, it's getting memory information, it's getting schema, uh, it's getting uh, um, value information, it's getting homeostatic information, it's integrating all of that stuff. And all of our, our experiences are not unimodal, they're not just visual, they're multimodal. So we need to have a multimodal 
kind of hub that can put all that stuff together. And I think that the prefrontal cortex as a whole can do that. Um, it's not just about one area of prefrontal cortex. It's about the whole system working together. There's lots of recurrence and redundancy. Uh, and I think that's, that, that will be very important as, as we go forward. So we are running very quickly out of time, but let me talk about the dual mental model thing, because I think that's also uh, interesting. So at the very beginning, we talked about how we're talking, but we're not planning what we say is just coming out. So that is the, the, an output of the non-conscious mental model. I think that's the starting point. So we have a mental model that's taking in all of this information. Oh, sorry, yeah, we have a circuit that's taking in all this information um, about you know stimuli from the outside, from the inside, homeostatic value information, memories, uh, external events, internal events, all that stuff is coming in to the, the first stage of the mental model uh, and being integrated. So the first stage is a schema. The schema is a situationally relevant uh, bunch of memories that are integrated to uh, allow you to understand the situation you're in. So we're in an interview situation. So you and I have done this a lot, so we can just sit down here and start talking. We don't have to like worry about how it's all gonna come out, you know, because we've done it, we know what it is. It's like we have a, a feeling of rightness. We have a, no, a, we have a noetic experience that allows us to not be upset and move into thoughts and worries about it and all of that. So, um, we, we have to, uh, the, the, I think the, the schema are providing the template for all of that. And then the template, the, 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 the schema is then being integrated with information or the mental model is being integration. Inter uh, the mental model is being filled with information about the schema that sets up the situation, but also about the immediate environment, also about memories and all of the other things that are going on. So it all comes together as uh, a unit of, a, of the moment, and that unit of the moment then generates a Middle East amodal narrative. That is a, a neural code that can take all of those various kinds of multimodal, different modality things that are, that are being processed in the moment, put them into a whole, and then turn it into a non-modality specific amodal code that can then be used to control other systems. One system that that controls is speech. So we're talking without, uh, the mental model is controlling our speech without us consciously thinking about it. Another system that it can control is goal-directed behavior. Speech is a kind of goal-directed behavior, but it can also just be a speech act. And I think we're just doing kind of, you know, uh, just non-conscious speech acts and, and you know, words and ideas are coming out. Fairly, okay, not you know I'm kind of stumbling here, but uh, the words are coming out. You know what I'm talking about. Then the third aspect of the the third tributary of this uh, out this the stream coming out this amodal narrative stream is consciousness itself. So the the thing that comes out the the amodal narrative that is the potential source of self understanding. That is what gives us our narrative self that go, when we become conscious of it. But it also controls your behavior and your speech. Now, what we say and what we do are not always exactly in sync in the situation. And both of those can differ a little bit from what we're conscious of, right? So the, the point is that um, there are neural pathways leading to each of those outcomes. And because there are additional process, there's additional processing once you leave the narrative stream, then each is gonna be somewhat different because there's noise introduced in the processing channel after they divide. Now, okay, so we've got the, the ability to talk about the non-conscious model, we've got the ability to act on the non-conscious model, and we have the ability to use the non-conscious model to give us a conscious experience. And that information then goes back into the non-conscious middle model from the conscious middle model and gives us a processing loop that's continuously updated. But the conscious middle model can also talk, act, and be conscious of itself. So I have two middle models. One is non-conscious, one is conscious, uh, and they serve different purposes. 
So how do the, but it creates a problem for studying consciousness because we never know in an experiment, for example, which mental model is talking, acting, and so forth, and experiencing. So what's the solution? Well, I gave a lecture at Yale and a graduate student wrote to me afterwards and uh, she had a solution. She said, well, she is, she works in an area where they, where they use this kind of AI coding of, uh, of text to, you know, for example, if you're trying to, you can tell that you've moved from one paragraph to another because the content changes and you can analyze the content and so forth. So what she suggested was that uh, the, the non-conscious mental model was likely to be less coherent, me kind of jumping around from idea to idea. Uh, so the non-conscious output, mental model output, uh, when you talk is likely to be less co coherent and so forth. Uh, you know, we kind of like talk, then we have to step back. But when we step back and start thinking about it, then we've bumped it up to the conscious middle model, which is going to be a little more coherent, uh, and especially if you're giving a speech and you've planned it and you've got all the words in your head and so forth, or you're reading it and you're conscious of it. it it's going to be more coherent. It's going to hold together more as a unit than one coming by the non-conscious, uh, coming out of the non-conscious output. So, you know, I think um, that... Um, it's it's a hypothesis. It, I don't have data, uh, but uh, I think it's kind of interesting and certainly worth uh, make generate some discussion at least. I wish there were. This was so interesting. I wish there were time for follow ups. But um, the four realms was so great. You're so widely read, and really, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. And good luck. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Earhart. <laughs>